Greetings, my name is Ryan Nitsch. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. Joining me here today is Eduardo. Hi, Ryan. My name is Eduardo. I'm a solutions architect with Amazon Web Services. Eduardo Planning Analytics, or IBM Planning Analytics. What is it? And let's talk about what we have currently in terms of what customers are deploying on AWS. Sure. So IBM Planning Analytics has been around for a long time. So it's a very robust and proven solution already that customers use to basically plan their businesses, right? So they can do forecasting of things like uh, sales. They can do market marketing planning, logistics planning. They can do tryout simulations using planning analytics. And it uses something called TM1 server, which is a large in-memory database, an OAP in-memory database that allows these customers to do these simulations in near real time and allows several different business units to, to work together to, to combine data points together to generate insights into their business and plan it. Um, operational and finance, but I imagine that this is lending itself much more to the sort of finance yes. forecasting decision-making exactly. process. Yes. Okay, so when we bring this, because it is such a, a, a program that has been in businesses for so long, I imagine its historical implementation on AWS is largely traditional virtual machine based. It's, it's EC2 with software running on top of it. Is that correct? That's correct. So today we have uh, a, a version of planning analytics called version 11, which is virtual machines based, right? So we're talking about EC2 instances and what customers are, are looking for when they talk to us is really for ways to improve the resiliency and the availability of their TM1 installation. So that's what they're trying to get from AWS and also TM1 server is a very large in-memory database, and it can get very large. So they're looking at very large EC2 instances. Is it typically X series? Yes, instance exactly. Types. Okay. So this is not something that typically is easy to get on an on-premises environment, right? So they're trying to get the benefit from AWS by moving TM1 server to AWS. Okay, so looking at what you've got here, I, I see two distinct layers that are interesting to me. The first is the, the TM1 sort of backend environment, which is the in-memory database. Uh, I find it very interesting that it is, one of them is a primary active system and the other one seems to be in a, in a standby yeah, recovery. Uh, is there a, storage environments, some sort of shared storage to synchronize the data between these two? Sure. So you're going to use uh, Amazon EBS or things like your operating system uh, volumes and you're going to use that for like the application binaries where you deploy the TM1 code. Anything that's, that's yeah, mutable. Right? Exactly. Okay. And then uh, because of the nature of TM1 being an, an active passive architecture, as you said, you know, and it's an in-memory database, what happens there is that you have a lot of data stored in memory, right, in the RAM memory of your, your virtual machine. And if you need to fail over, right, you need to persist that data into a local disk, and then that data needs to be accessible to the, your standby server, right? Now, because we are looking at a, a setup here that helps improve resiliency, we are looking at deploying this across a different availability zones. So we need a way to have the data available to our standby instance in a different availability zone. Okay. EFS is actually great for that because you've got endpoints in each AZ, so you cut away from the concept of, of replicating yes, the data. So you right. don't duplicate the stored data. You, you mentioned recovery, but at the same time, I'm looking at that web layer. So I'm assuming that auto scaling or some mechanism yes. of, of replacement is existing here. Yeah, and as you can see here, there are two different layers, let's say, of, of the web portion, right? So you have something that's already containerized, which is called Planning Analytics Workspace, and that can run on Red Hat OpenShift service on AWS. And at the same time, you have more of a legacy version of it, which is called IBM TM1 Web, and that's like a WebSphere Liberty-based application. Okay. So, so you can definitely use something like auto-scaling groups to, to... Okay, so, so two different approaches. Yes. One is, is building out virtual machines. The other one is, is yes. deploying additional containerized pods. Correct. Can they coexist or would you pick one or the other? Yeah, they can coexist, especially if you have already, uh, you know, workloads that are more legacy oriented on TM1 that will be using TM1 web. And then on planning analytics workspaces, it can also access the same TM1 database at the back end. 
but it gives you a more modern take on the on the solution. Is is there the option for customers to have customizations? Yes. Hook into the, the web sphere. Correct. Right. Okay. Uh, from a auto scaling perspective, when we're looking at the TM1 web, so these are EC2 instances. Typical web application as Java, load Java increases, exactly. deploy more EC2 exactly. instances, scale it, and it sits behind a load balancer. Yeah. I, I don't think that is really feasible on the TM1 in-memory database. So I'm assuming that's more of a, if there's a problem, do a health check and Correct. then facilitate failover. So this is auto-scaling minimum one, maximum one Correct. cut over. To make sure that you always have one there. Okay, but now you, I see a problem here. If, if you're talking about in-memory database and you've got something like a health check that identifies a problem at the application level, auto-scaling could easily bring up another instance, but then the data that's in-memory currently on the old instance, something would have to pull that out, persist it. Correct. What is doing the detection on that process? How's the logic facilitate that? So that's where you can use things like Amazon CloudWatch and you can detect these failures in, in your application logs and you can trigger an alarm, you can trigger an event. And what you can do is like in this example here, you, you could call out a Lambda function that will detach that EC2 instance from your auto scaling group to prevent it from being terminated. So you let the auto scaling group spin up the new instance. At the same time, you can send an alert via Amazon SNS to your SREs, to your operations team, and they can connect to the failed instance as it has been removed from the auto scaling group. They can do troubleshooting, they can run their processes to you know, persist the, the in-memory data to disk and make sure that data is available to the standby instance so that as it boots up and you know, starts the instance, they can, it can load that data into memory and rebuild the, the in-memory application for you. Now, you mentioned failed instance, and I think what you actually meant is failed, failed in application. application level. Correct. Hypothetically speaking, if the underlying host, the instance itself, had to hit a bump in the road, it's unlikely you'd be able to connect to it. So I'm assuming in that case, you're going to be taking that data and rerunning sort of import processes from Correct. Your, your data source. Correct. So that's where it becomes important to take backups. So you can take snapshots of your EBS volumes, but also use things like Amazon Backup to take backup of your EFS data. And also TM1 does have processes where you can, it's like cron jobs, like you can run jobs on TM1 to, to uh, persist the in-memory data to disk, and you can schedule the, the periodicity of where that, when that's going to run. And then you can have that data available because you're using EFS, it's going to be available to the standby instance. So th there are some things here where there is scale. Yep. There are some things here where there is resilience. But I mean, this is a large application this stack. Large, it's, yeah. it's complex. So I, I think it, it's been really great to run through this because I've got a better understanding now of which of the components where I can easily scale, which of the components that potentially warrant some consideration within the context yeah. of my business, and, and, and how would I measure that impact. I think this yeah. has some ramifications from an RTO, RPO Correct. perspective, depending on the situation that we're in. Yeah, and here you also see another pattern that's possible. So even for those customers that, you know, they don't want to, to use auto scaling for TM1 for, because of their business requirements, right? Maybe they need to have both instances always ready to go, but one of them is out, out of rotation, but it's already started. I know from a cost point of view, that's not optimized, but maybe that's a requirement that they need to have a much faster recovery time. But then if you're taking out auto scaling, I'm assuming this is going to be a detect, notify, and, and manual yes. response. Yes. So one, one possibility <coughs> is that this, the same idea you would detect uh, from Amazon CloudWatch, and you can generate an alert for, for, the, for your uh, site reliability engineers. You, you said you, that was going to go through SNS. So I'm assuming yeah. SNS going to site reliability engineer, you could potentially hook this into something like a, uh, a ServiceNow type. Yeah, ServiceNow or Slack or something like that. And then you could have even automation, like you can trigger a Lambda function to reconfigure the target groups on your network load balancer that sits between the TM1 web and the TM1 server, and you can change the target group, right? So you can remove the unhealthy instance and replace it with the healthy one. Okay, so you're flipping the target group. So instead of sending traffic to the load balancer to the old instance, yeah. the load balancer literally redirects it yes. to the replacement. Wearing an older hat, why not do that at a DNS level? 
Well, DNS normally has some delay in terms of uh, when you change the DNS settings of propagation. So you could be looking at uh, a little bit of a delay there for the for the TM1 web and the uh, planning analytics work. That would be within, yeah. you know, that, that's propagation much exactly. further out exactly. as we hit other ISPs exactly. and things. So there are other yeah. patterns, you know, that we, we've chosen these two here just to show some of the possibilities out there. Now this is planning analytics version 11. Version 11. There's a version 12. There's a version 12, yes. And version 12 is a, is a SaaS offer from IBM on AWS. And it's a, a, a redesign of planning analytics where it runs completely inside uh, OpenShift as a containerized platform. Okay, so a lot of what we've done here in terms of uh, remediation is now facilitated by OpenShift. That's correct. At, That's correct. A, and IBM well. also has um, mechanisms that allow customers on version 11 to migrate to version 12. Okay. Cool. okay. Uh, Eduardo, as always, thank you. It's a fantastic journey being here with you. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.